On the seals are the names of Nehemiah the governor, the son of Hakaliah, Zedekiah, Seraiah, Azariah, Jehemiah, Pashur, Amariah, Malkajah, Hatush, Shebaniah, Malak, Harim, Merahoth, Miramoth, Obadiah, Daniel, Ginnathon, Baruch, Meshalem, Abijah, Mijamin, Maziah, Bilgal, Shemaiah. These are the priests. And the Levites, Jeshua, the son of Azaniah, Benui, the sons of Hinadad, Kedmiel, and their brothers, Shebaniah, Hodiah, Kelita, Pelahiah, Hanan, Micah, Rehob, Heshabiah, Zakur, Sherebiah, Shebaniah, Hodiah, Bani, Beninu. The chiefs of the people, Parosh, Pahath Moab, Elam, Zatu, Bani, Bani, Asgad, Bibai, Adonijah, Bigvi, Aden, Ata, Hezekiah, Azur, Hodadiah, so Hodiah, Hashem, Bezai, Harif, Ananoth, Nebai, Magpash, Meshulam, Hazia, Meshzabel, Zadok, Jadua, Pelatiah, Hanan, Aniah, Hoshe, Hananiah, Hashab, Haloshesh, Pilha, Shobek, Reham, Heshabna, Masaiah, Ahiah, Hanan, Anan, Maluk, Harim, Bana. <laughs> the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his rules and his statutes. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. We also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. We, the priests, the Levites, and the people, have likewise cast lots for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God according to our father's houses at times appointed year by year to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord. Also to bring to the house of our God to the priests who minister in the house of our God the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks, and to bring the first of our dough and our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine and the oil, to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring to the Levites the tithes from our ground. For it is the Levites who collect the tithes in our towns where we labor." And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers, where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister, and the gatekeepers and the singers." We will not neglect the house of our God. Thank you, Cyrus. I must admit, 
one of my favorite things about learning um, when I came to this church, one of the favorite things that I learned about this church was that there's, was that there's Bible readers for me as the pastor. So I grew up, growing up in church, the pastor, dad, always just had to read whatever passage he picked. And so I am so grateful that someone else has to practice all those names because it saved me hours and hours of reading over and over. So thank you, Cyrus, and people who are better at reading than me. Um, let's, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to this passage, I ask that you would make each of us willing uh, to commit our lives to you, Heavenly Father. Make us willing and ready uh, to take up our cross and follow you and to serve with greater vigor and more generosity uh, than these people of yours who did not know the Lord Jesus and all that he has done. So Lord, make us a willing and obedient people uh, who walk in your ways. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the last uh, two chapters, I think, have been quite uh, moving chapters. Uh, they've finished building the wall, and then we have Ezra in chapter 8. He comes and he preaches the word so that everyone can understand it. And the people respond to that word that was preached with grief and thankfulness to God, but then also with a long uh, chapter there in chapter 9 of prayer and confession for their sin and the sins of their fathers. And now in chapter 10, the people are promising to walk in obedience to God. The word is preached, followed by confession of sins, then a changed life. It's encouraging to see God's people long ago, participating in the same process we go through today. Because whenever the word of God is preached, we want to see change too. Uh, we are here because we want to walk in obedience to God. And this place and his word is here to help us do that. To go from hearing the word, confessing our sins, and walking in obedience to God. So chapter 10 is going to highlight this walk of obedience, and it does it within the framework of a covenant. A covenant is a binding agreement between two parties, and the Bible covenant is most often used between a commitment between God and his people. The covenant that uh, the people made on this day is more of a recommitment rather than a new covenant. It's a commitment to the covenant that God made between him and his people in Exodus 24 uh, concerning how God's people should live uh, as this new nation that is being formed once they've been saved out of Egypt. And just note there in verse 29, they are committing to the covenant given or the laws and rules given through Moses. And before we get to the details of the covenant that kind of begin at verse 30, I just want to us to note what's going on in general here. Um, the whole community is coming together. So we have the names of the leaders who have signed in verses 1 to 27. And for, I think, practical reasons, I guess it's limited. Uh, the 50,000-odd people aren't going to come and sign one document, but they put forth their leaders uh, and representatives to sign on their behalf so that even today they can point to, this is who signed. This is our people, this is our tribe, uh, this is our community uh, committing to this covenant. But then we see there in verse 28 that the rest of the people came together and joined in this commitment as well. Uh, this is a public commitment they are making together. It's a little like what um, Kevin and Rebecca and Luke did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they committed uh, before us to raising Luke as parents in a godly uh, way, and we committed to helping them do that. It's similar to what, happened, uh, in, what happens in baptism when people stand before the church and declare their faith and their commitment to following Jesus. They're doing that publicly uh, for everyone to see. Uh, but it's also a very uh, practical commitment, uh, covenant they're entering into. Uh, this uh, covenant is going to affect every area of their life. They're not just... Um, assenting to some kind of intellectual doctrines about what they each need to believe, but to everyday discipleship and service of God in their life. And also note that it's not just in the um, 
practical things of building that temple or building the city that the people are united as one, but they are coming together to be united in their obedience to God's word and the morality and goodness that it uh, commands. Uh, we, as they were, are people who don't only share in working together and being part of this place, but we actually have a shared holiness uh, and character and godliness that we want to achieve and work towards together. I do also want us to really understand uh, that even this covenant, this old covenant, is motivated by God's grace and faithfulness. Uh, In chapter 9, Uh, The chapter before, in verse 31 and 32, we read that God has been gracious and merciful to Israel. He's keeping his covenant and steadfast love, even though God's people had rejected the covenant, broken the rules, uh, and not been faithful to their end of the bargain. And yet God would remain faithful to them. And so in light of that, we read in verse 39, because of all this, because of God's grace, because of how he will not let go of his people, we, commit, we make a firm covenant in writing. So that's what they're doing. They're responding to how God has been gracious and steadfast in his love towards his people. They're responding to that and saying, now we want to make a commitment to serving and following you. Uh, and that's what we do as well. We want to be motivated and empowered uh, by God's grace. Uh, today's sermon has a uh, lot to say about how we are to live and walk in obedience to God, uh, but it must be motivated by God's grace and what he's done for you, not to try earn his favor, not to try and earn your salvation, but out of thankfulness for God's grace. When the word is preached, we confess our sins, we know God's grace and forgiveness, and so we begin to obey him uh, more and more. Okay, so that's the covenant, this public and very practical commitment that is a response to God's grace. Uh, What does it look like? What did it look like for them to live by this covenant? Well, I think they make, in general, three commitments which relate to uh, separation from other nations around them, uh, Sabbath worship, so what they were to do on the Sabbath day and Sabbath year, and supporting the temple. Now, this isn't the whole law of Moses. I think they're committing to the whole law of Moses. But what uh, is done here is that a few key regulations or laws that particularly uh, would be particularly important to them at that stage, they bring them to the front and they commit to them. And uh, they even, um, uh, not add to them, but they kind of apply them to their context at the time and how it would be useful to serve God uh, and respond to him in light of the covenant. And while uh, you and I, we're not under this covenant, we're not uh, ob- uh, obligated to keep these laws, I do think that there are principles in them that we can carry through today into our new covenant and our new commitment with God. Uh, Paul says in Romans that uh, the law uh, was a guideline for love. So all the loving God and loving your neighbor. And so all these laws were to help Israel love God and serve him and love their neighbor and serve them. And so I think there's principles about how we love one another and serve God that can be found uh, and applied to us. There's uh, principles behind them. And so I think the principles are we have this idea of separation from the other nations. Uh, If we're going to follow Jesus and have him Lord of our life and commit to following him, it's going to affect our relationships. We're going to be separated and different in some ways. Uh, Following Jesus as our Lord will affect our time, that Sabbath worship, how we're using our time. And finally, it will affect our possessions and the money that we have, Uh, So, in contrast to supporting the temple. So this uh, covenant, this commitment they made is going to help teach us about how we can live today as Christians under this new covenant that we celebrated with uh, Uh, This morning, where Jesus' blood was poured out for us, where his body was broken, he made a new covenant with us that we've entered into, but I think we can still learn from this old one. So first, um, we commit, uh, the people at the time, they committed to being a separate people, and for us to follow Jesus, it will affect our relationships as well. 
So look first at verse 28. Uh, there was a group of people there who uh, weren't uh, Israelites, but they had separated themselves from their nation, their people, and they'd come to follow and believe in God. And they are committing today, on that day, they are committing to following Yahweh, Israel's God, and to being Israel's God's people. So we already have some people who have separated and are living out this covenant. And then in verse 30, we read uh, that we will not give our daughters uh, to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. So here we see God wanted a people who would be distinct and holy as a witness to the nations around them. I don't think this is saying uh, that it's a racial distinction. I think God is trying to create a moral and holiness distinction between the two, between his people and anyone else. And I say that because uh, Israel wasn't purely Jew Jewish. Um, Joseph, he married an Egyptian, and he had two half-Egyptian sons, and they were the heads of tribes named, and the tribes were still named after those children. 400 years later, when Israel left uh, Egypt, uh, Egyptians were welcome to come and join uh, Israel, join and follow Israel's God, and they did. Uh, while entering the promised land, we have the example of Rahab and her family who joined Israel. As you look at the book uh, through the Bible, we have a book of the Bible written about Ruth, who was a, a Moabite uh, woman who married into God, uh, God's family and became part of Jesus' uh, family tree. Uh, and it was a good and appropriate thing for her uh, to be married into God's family, uh, God's people. She had committed to following God, the one true God of Israel, uh, and given her life in following uh, that, uh, uh, following God. Uh, and then even today's passage, we see that there's already people who have separated from their nation and have joined God's uh, covenant people. Uh, we see also uh, in chapter 13 of Nehemiah, uh, this concern that there's some people who have married, uh, who have spouses um, from foreign nations, and the kids are growing up without the ability to speak Hebrew. And so because they can't speak Hebrew, they can't read God's word, or they can't listen or understand God's word when they go to the temple. So they're growing up without knowing uh, the one true God. And that's the problem. They're not growing up knowing the one true God. And so I think this was about a spiritual uh, loyalty, not ethnic differences. Uh, and I'm sure anyone who's married to a non-Christian will know the tension that comes uh, when you are trying to be faithful to God while also loving your spouse. Uh, this is not a good or easy place to be. Uh, God doesn't want his people to have this dual loyalty where they're committing to someone uh, in life who isn't committed to God. So walking in obedience, following Jesus, uh, means spiritual loyalty to him. And in the New Testament, uh, as new Christians, new covenant believers, uh, James makes this exact point. He said in James 4.4, 4, he says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Uh, therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit that he has caused to dwell in you. To follow Jesus means we will be a separate people from the world, that our hearts would be yearning for God, seeking God, not chasing after this world, or yearning and seeking after the things or people in this world. Often when people first come to God, perhaps they're not a Christian yet, and they're just trying to decide if Jesus is someone they want to follow. They will have questions about what God allows. Is this behavior okay? If I follow Jesus, will I have to give up this, this boyfriend or this girlfriend? Um, what will other people think uh, of my decision to follow Jesus? And eventually you reach a crossroads where you have to decide, will I be loyal and separate for Jesus or will I stay with the world? And that is the decision we each must make. Uh, Jesus calls us to be a separate people. Are you flirting with the world, enjoying its pleasures, uh, camouflaging in with your friends so that you're living differently on Sunday 
and the rest of the week. Following Jesus means we are a separate people in the world, but not of the world. That's the first commitment they made to being a separate people. And following Jesus will affect our relationships as well. Now, the second commitment they make is to Sabbath worship. Uh, So following Jesus affects our time. Uh, Look with me at verse 31. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day, and we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. A Sabbath was one day a week when Israel might offer worship to God, undistracted from everyday, uh, the everyday demands of life. It was one day which they were to rest from their work and take a break. Here is another way that God's people were to be distinct uh, in the interactions with those around them, no trading on the Sabbath. Uh, but they were also to stop working and to live by faith. Uh, so if you stopped uh, working, it meant you stopped earning, uh, but you were to trust that the God of creation uh, would work for you, uh, that he would look after you, and you were to trust that if you devoted a day to him, then he would be faithful to you the other six days. Trust that it is good for you to honor God and to rest from your work trusting him. Uh, but it's more than that, more than just taking a rest on that day. Uh, uh, they are committed to not uh, planting crops every seventh year. Now, we're not required to do this one, but uh, I want you to imagine that you had a business and God said that you were to shut it down for a year. The situation isn't exactly the same, but you can imagine the loss of profits, uh, the competition uh, getting ahead of you, and if God were to do that, I'm sure that you would certainly feel God very specifically putting his finger on your means of production and uh, wealth creation and saying, that's mine, uh, not yours. Uh, do with it as I say, uh, trust me with it. Now, you might wonder how someone survived uh, without planting crops uh, for a whole year. It's a question that I certainly asked as I was reading through this passage. Uh, well, in Exodus 23, 10 and 11, we read that they were to let their fields lie um, furrowed or uncultivated. And what that meant is like when you forget about your garden and you stop doing any work on it and everything seeds and sprouts. And so there's still actually some food there. It's just not as much or as good as you would like. And in the Exodus passage, it says that in that seventh year, or when that field is uh, at rest, uh, the poor can come and they're allowed to take food from any field that is at rest. Uh, And so it was a way for people to share and love uh, their community. And it shows, I guess, the sense that God uh, owns that property and he owns that year of produce. Uh, Now, presumably, farmers would have their seventh year staggered so that if you were poor, there was always a field somewhere in Israel where you could go and receive and find food. Uh, And and while I'm not um, much of a greenie myself, these two verses, Nehemiah 10.31 and Exodus 23.11, they are very striking verses, specifically uh, Exodus, because it says that the land needs rest, just like we need rest. It needs a year's rest. Um, The land's God's, all the land of this earth, and he wants us to use it responsibly in the same way you wouldn't force someone to work seven days a week, uh, 24-7, over and over again. We recognize that that's not a very loving and good thing to do. There's just these couple of verses in the Bible that says uh, the land needs rest as well. And so while I wouldn't want these verses to be um, wrongly used for any particular political agenda, I do think we need to stop and recognize the goodness of God in giving us this wonderful earth that produces uh, everything that we use today. Uh, What you're sitting on has been produced by the earth that God's given us. And so we do want to be uh, using it responsibly and honoring uh, God in the way Uh, we go about using the world that he's blessed us with. 
Um, Israel, though, they commit to setting aside the seventh day that they're not going to work, and then the seventh year for God. And so God makes demands of their time and what they're going to do with it and what they're not going to do with it. And I don't believe we're under these obligations, of, as I've said, to observe any particular day or this year, uh, but we are commanded to uh, meet together to worship, and Sunday uh, is the pattern that the apostles started, Sunday being the day that Jesus was resurrected. They, um, the, the Sabbath was originally a Saturday, but um, the church started meeting on a Sunday because that's when Jesus rose. And so this is the pattern that we follow. Uh, and God himself rested on one day uh, at creation. He worked for six days creating the earth, and the seventh day he rested. So there seems to be some creation wisdom involved in resting from your work uh, and uh, trusting in God uh, that he will provide and he will help you even if you feel you should work seven days a week. Um, and so I do think we are, uh, it is a very wise and good thing to rest uh, and to it's, a, I think, a commanded thing that we worship God. And so Sunday is the day that we can do that. And so uh, I'm very uh, glad and very encouraged that each one of you is here this morning uh, to honor God with your time, to say, God, you are, you are worthy of this time to worship and praise you and seek time and speak uh, and have time in your word, uh, learning about you. I'm sure that for lots of you, there's a long list of other commitments and things that you could do uh, on Sunday morning, uh, things that might really help you get ahead in life uh, and this world, and yet it is good for you to say, uh, no, God, you are the most important. I'm here uh, to worship you. Uh, God says, uh, stop, uh, rest, uh, worship me, uh, use your time uh, for me. So that's the second uh, commitment they made to Sabbath worship, uh, God rules over their time. The third commitment they make is to support the temple. And so following Jesus affects our possessions and what we do with them. Now this final section is quite long. Uh, it is uh, their commitment to the temple, the house of the Lord. And it seems like perhaps before when Israel had a wealthy king like David, that the king paid for the repairs of uh, the temple and the upkeep of the temple and all the things that went into that. But now that they don't have a wealthy and rich king, uh, that the people are actually coming together and saying, we are going to pay for the upkeep of the temple. And this section can be summed up there in verse uh, 39. We will not neglect the house of our God. Um, they committed to uh, regularly giving to the temple. Uh, we see that in verses 32 to 33. Uh, for a third of a shekel, and we have a list of the activities that happened at the temple, and the, I guess there were costs associated with them. The temple was a place where praise was offered through grain offerings, pardon was secured through sacrifice, uh, festivals and celebrations took place, added to that the upkeep of this temple with its gold and ornaments, and also uh, the sp supporting of priests who didn't own land and didn't work but served God in the temple. I can see that it would cost Israel to have this place of worship. It would cost uh, Israel to proclaim the one true God. Uh, we have that uh, interesting verse there, verse 34, and this collection of wood that happened. Uh, and it seems that perhaps if you couldn't pay a third of a shekel, so particularly the Levites, and the priests wouldn't be able to because they didn't own land and couldn't earn money. They were serving God. Uh, and also a, a poor person might not be able to pay a third of a shekel each year in this regular giving. And so there was this option to collect wood. Uh, and obviously they needed wood for burnt offerings and to keep fires going in the uh, temple. And while in New Zealand it might not be a problem for you to go collect a handful of wood, uh, you'll probably get it from your backyard. If you can just picture Israel, uh, the land of Israel, and how barren it is of trees, that it's actually probably quite a time-consuming process to go and collect wood. And so it seemed that there's this option for those who were poor, who perhaps had more time, they didn't have to manage and run uh, a, a lot of land, they had time, and so they could go and use that in service of God uh, to collect wood. But we see that they, whatever they were doing, they were giving to God uh, in a regular way, regularly giving to God's temple. 
But uh, we also see that it wasn't just regular, but it was a priority for them. They were committing to making a priority. So we see in the next section there, verses 35 to 37, we have this uh, repetition of the word first. Israel was um, giving uh, to God first and foremost, bringing the first of the ground, the trees, the herds, the bread, the oil, the wine, even the first of your house, your first son is to be given. But there were, of course, laws that allowed you essentially to buy your son back. Uh, or in any of these uh, grains and herds, there were ways in which you would pay uh, instead of giving that thing. Um, but you were giving first. Whatever you received, whatever good gift God gave to you, you back gave back the first of that portion. And we, don't, we kind of have different foods all year round. If you really want a watermelon, you'll probably be able to buy a really expensive watermelon. But when you are agricultural, uh, living in a, by agriculture, you know, the first fruits were really, really important. And you've finally got your first watermelon of the year, and you've been looking forward to it, and you've been growing it in your backyard. And that first one was to be given to God as recognition of Him who has given uh, everything to you. Uh, he was given to you first. And so to walk in obedience uh, meant recognizing that uh, God was Lord over your possessions. And while today we're not under obligation by any laws uh, to give, a uh, following Jesus still means we will give to the building of his church. We give with a grateful heart because of his grace. I just listened to this passage from uh, 2 Corinthians 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints." And it goes on to say, For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Uh, Paul puts this church forward uh, as a wonderful example of generosity. First, they're uh, committed to the Lord, and so they're able to give uh, joyfully, not under obligation to anyone, but joyfully, even in times of affliction and poverty. Notice that they're made, motivated by uh, God's uh, grace, uh, not the law. He, Jesus, became poor, came down to earth, gave up the riches of heaven so that we ourselves could enjoy heaven. Uh, and as uh, you think of your possessions and I think of my possessions and income, uh, we must really start with God who has gifted it to us. And we want to reflect upon his grace in becoming poor his uh, grace in giving us uh, everything that we have. And I think as we do this, uh, we will find that we budget differently. There's lots of expenses in life, uh, rent and mortgage, food, kids' activities, uh, saving, uh, fuel. Um, and sometimes what we do is we budget for all that, and then whatever remains, uh, that's for God. I will let God's grace and his uh, goodness to you and the example of this covenant commitment made in Nehemiah. Uh, let this teach us uh, to budget first to God because he is worthy of it, because he has given uh, all to us. And as uh, we look at our church budget each year, uh, we can truly give thanks that God has uh, provided for all our needs and uh, me and my family are particularly grateful to God for his uh, provision to us that we might uh, serve him here uh, without um, any want or need or any fear uh, that uh, he will not provide and that the church will not provide. So we're very thankful to that. I know someone spoke at a church about giving because the church wasn't giving at all. Uh, and so the pastor obviously got someone else in to come and talk about that but it did just make me very grateful for the generosity that overflows in the hearts of those who are here. So the word has been preached. The people had confessed their sins, and now they committed to, to separation, uh, to Sabbath worship, and to supporting the temple. And I hope you can see uh, the continuity with our life 
our discipleship with Jesus. Jesus is Lord over our relationships, requiring separation. He's Lord over our time, requiring that we worship him and rest. And he's Lord over our possessions, our giving to his work. But as we end, let me just highlight one a big difference between us and Israel. In verse 29 there, uh, this verse may have stood out to you as it did to me. It says that they are uh, in entering this covenant, they were entering into a curse and an oath, meaning that if they didn't live up to this promise, if they didn't keep their oath, then God could curse them and could remove all his blessings and goodness from them. This is not us today. Uh, Israel had proved through this covenant over and over again that they and we uh, as fallen human beings cannot keep our covenant We don't stick to our commitments and so deserve the curse. And as uh, I've talked about our relationships and times, uh, time and possessions, I'm sure that to some degree, as with me, Jesus has not been and is not Lord over each area of your life, as he should be. Uh, But I want you to listen uh, carefully to Galatians 3.10. This is our new covenant, uh, sealed with Jesus' blood, uh, securing us forgiveness of sins eternally. Listen to Galatians 3.10. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it's written, cursed be anyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does the law shall live by it. But Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. In the new covenant, the commitment we have entered into Jesus represents us. Jesus takes the curse for our disobedience because we just couldn't keep the law. We just can't live well and right in a relationship with God. And so he gets cursed, his death and rejection from God. He gets cursed so that we could receive the blessing of being in a relationship with the one true God. And we enter that by faith, trusting in Jesus, trusting in his death, knowing his grace to us. God is faithful to us. We know that he will always be faithful because he has cursed Jesus for our disobedience. And it's only from this place of faith and amazement and wonder towards God that you are able and I am able to walk out of church today in obedience to him, thankful to him, grateful to him, freed to follow and serve him. May we be that people together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, please do become more and more each day Lord of our life, that we may honor you in every area, Heavenly Father, in every way with all that you give us. I thank you so much for the Lord Jesus and for his grace towards us who are so needy. Lord, please bring conviction as your word has been preached today. And Lord, please bring obedience as we respond to how wonderful you've been to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and sing of God's wonderful grace to us? Grace amazing, pure and deep, 
who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead who brought back from the dead our lord jesus christ the great shepherd of the sheep may he hear- 